A COVID Christmas Eve A modern parallel to the story of Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and the innkeeper. Yusuf busted his butt working in the lumber department at Lowe's in South Savannah, Georgia. He took every shift he could get. He was earning every penny he could since his fiancee, Miriam, was pregnant with what they hoped was the first of many kids they would have together. In her ninth month, she wasn't able to work as a dance teaching assistant at the College of Art and Design there in Savannah. Plus, classes were not being held at this time of year anyway. So, Yusuf was the only one making money for the two, almost the three of them. Except for the occasional racist jab, some intended his whisper, some not, he was well liked on the job by his bosses, co-workers, and customers. And why not? He knew a lot about woodworking. Back in his home country, Bahrain, his father had been a master carpenter from whom he had learned a great deal even by the time he was nine years old in 2011 when his parents had gotten themselves and their children out of that country because of growing persecution of Shia Muslims, the branch of Islam with which they identified. They lived for four years in Toronto and then moved south to the Savannah, Georgia area to get some warmer climates for them, to de-assault their Bahraini bones. Much to his parents' dismay, Many of the particulars of organized religion had lost meaning for Yusuf, though he still considered himself Muslim and a follower of Allah, just not the Allah who rewarded suicide bombers with heavenly sex for eternity, in heaven of course, and who seriously cared that his fiancée, the finest person he knew or had ever known, was pregnant before they were married officially, or that she was lesser as a human being than any male. He still prayed five times daily because he wanted to, and not because he felt he had to or else, and his favorite television show was Rami. Those had to count for something. Getting into the United States near the end of the Obama administration, immigration was manageable, but they had feared for their green card progress, especially in Georgia and been asked to jump through odd hoops the whole of the Trump administration. Green cards seemed in reach a number of times, only to be yanked back by immigration agents. The most recent hoop was the oddest one. A certified letter had arrived 10 days ago giving him an appear date at the immigration office in Atlanta, the only one in Georgia, where applicants were allowed to deal with green card matters, and they gave him the 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. window on December the 24th. Even though Miriam's immigration updates were on a different schedule, they had decided that she would join him on the trip to Atlanta to see if, while there, they could update her information as well rather than call her at a random moment to make that four-hour trip after the baby had arrived. Slim odds, but they might as well try, they thought. They decided they would head up to Atlanta early on Christmas Eve morning so they could be in the immigration building at 2 o'clock sharp that afternoon. 
Just about everything was uncomfortable for Miriam by that point in the pregnancy. Moving, not moving, thinking about moving. To save money, they had purchased a very used Mini Cooper with a troubled front seat that wasn't exactly well attached to the floorboard. Yusuf did his best to create a comfortable seat for his beloved, and to the eye, it did indeed look like sitting on it would be like sitting on a cloud. However, neither of them had anticipated that the initial problem would create its own discomfort for the duration of the journey, getting down into the car in the first place, and the movement of the seat. A little to the left, a little to the right, a little to the front, a little to the back, was slightly akin to riding donkeys on her uncle's farm when she was a little girl. Miriam was a trooper, though, and she tried diligently not to yell out in pain, so when pain sounds did come forth, they were involuntary. And Yusuf, who adored her, felt every one of those pains with her. He had seen something on the Dr. Oz show, though he was embarrassed for anybody to know he ever watched it, about sympathetic labor pains that expectant fathers could experience when they saw the soon-to-be mother of their child agonizing. Now he realized, as everything below his pelvis ached when he heard her indications of pain, even though he was perfectly comfortable, that there was something to it. He drove as slowly as he could, but still wanted to get to Atlanta in plenty of time to be on time. They drove across Interstate 16 East, merging into 75 North when Miriam needed another bathroom break. Yusuf arrived and got into the building well before two. He had taken a number, even though there was only a handful of people scattered across the sea of institutional chairs on Christmas Eve afternoon, maybe five or six people besides him. He didn't understand how he could have to wait so long when so few people were there, and he was worried about Miriam who waited in the car. Even with a mask, she was so worried about getting sick and making their newborn sick. An hour and a half after he had taken a seat, an immigration officer called his number only the third number that had been called the whole time he had sat there. Yusuf went in nervously. How else could he feel? The agent appeared disinterested, because she was, and probably angry that she had been assigned to work on Christmas Eve. She simply stared at her computer screen, mumbling to herself, Let's see... Why have we called you here? To tell me I can finally get a green card, I hope. Get real, child, she said dismissively. No chance, that's why we sent for you. His heart sank. He feared the worst, deportation. For who knew what reason? Oh, I see what it is. We haven't been able to reach you by phone, and we needed to be sure you were still in the country and that we have the correct phone number on record. Yes, ma'am, I'm still here, uh, and the number I have is the same one and the only one I've ever had since my parents allowed me to get a cell phone four or so years ago, but ma'am, you had me miss work? When I'm really needed and with a very pregnant wife to provide this information, could I, could I not have responded to your mail with something written? Ignoring his reasonable suggestion, she said, Well, you should answer your phone. Save us all tons of trouble. You don't want I showing up at your door, do you? No, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Of course I don't. I'm sorry. But my phone doesn't show any calls or messages from anybody except friends and family members for months. Well, I'd say you need a new phone or a new phone service, mister. Next! 
Thelma Lynn, call the next person. Back on the road, after a bathroom break, they saw a gas station convenience store that appeared from the interstate to be open and decided to get some nibble food to get them home. By the time they were no further south than Macon, Miriam said, I can't go any longer, Yus. We, we need to stop for the night. So he took the next Macon exit. They hadn't realized how many motels would be flat out closed on Christmas Eve. Normally, most of them would have been open, but not in the middle of the COVID crisis. Numeric restrictions and the chances of having little or no business at all had most of the motels by which they drove darkened with closed signs, more or less, in view. Finally, they saw a Motel 6, which appeared to be open. Yusuf drove up to the front door and jumped out of their mini coop as quickly as he could. He tapped on the window that was used for checking in after dark customers, and after a few minutes, a young man appeared at the window to help him. Yusuf was about ready to speak when the young man at the window said, I'm sorry, sir, we're at numeric capacity. We have available rooms, but I'm not allowed to have any more people in the building than we already have here. Yusuf blurted out, but, but you don't understand. You, you, you don't understand. My wife is 18 months pregnant. We have to find some place for her to stay. If I, could, if I could just get her to a place where she could rest, please. The young man at the window said again, quite sincerely, I'm so, so sorry, sir, that I can't help you. He started to turn away and then immediately whirled back to the window on one heel, faced Yusuf and said, I just thought of something. There might be a possibility. Wait here. I'll be back as quickly as I can. He walked away. And after maybe five minutes, which seemed like an eternity to Yusuf and two eternities to Miriam, the young man returned and said, this isn't the best solution, but it's better than anything else you're going to find around here tonight. One of our guests is driving an RV. It's parked out back, charging up, and she says you're more than welcome to use it for the night. She's masking up and bringing the keys right now. The desk clerk And the RV lady must have been angels, they thought. Yusuf and Miriam were beyond delighted, and when they were in the RV, they found that it was actually quite nice, quite comfortable. Just as Miriam rolled onto the bed, though, her water broke. Yusuf ran back to the front window and in his loudest possible voice uh, through the window asked the young man who had been so helpful where the closest hospital was to which the young man replied, oh, oh, not very close at all, not close enough for somebody whose water just broke. Go back to your wife. I'm going to call the EMTs. They arrived in minutes. After an extraordinarily short labor, especially for a first labor, their son was born. Mother and son, healthy. They called Miriam's cousin Elizabeth, who was her cousin, best friend, all rolled into one, and Elizabeth asked her, well, what have you named him? They didn't have an answer for her because having chosen not to know the child's gender ahead of time, they had not, not gone through any of those name choosing exercises. 
Yusuf ran back to the front window of Motel 6 one more time. He told the young man what had happened. Then he asked him what his name was. The young man lifted up the front of his hoodie to reveal a long-sleeved T-shirt. Across the top were centered the large, colorful words, Puerto Rico. And under those, in smaller, darker letters, his name, Jesus. Yusef gave him double thumbs up and ran back to the RV. Miriam, we will name him Jesus. For us in Arabic, he will be Yasu. Yasu, Allah delivers. Miriam realized what had happened and nodded in delight. The paramedics slipped back into the RV and explained that none of the nearest hospitals had any beds at all because of COVID spikes. They would stay just outside the RV in their vehicle in case anything unusual came up throughout the night. They had a backup team taking calls for them the rest of the evening. Before they left, Jesus slipped in too. He had to see his namesake, however briefly. Before the three visitors slipped out of the RV for the evening, so the exhausted family could rest, the paramedics left the name of the pediatrician who would be stopping in on them on her way to her office that morning. Miriam thought she might try a little nap and maybe baby Yasu would like one too. His first diaper was a doubled over paper towel held together with some tape borrowed from the paramedics. And his first crib was a sheet filled laundry basket. Miriam and Yusuf were so grateful to the kind folks from Macon. They would never forget. Good evening. You are hearing the voice of David Farmer, the pastor at Silverside Church. And it is my delight to welcome you to our online Christmas Eve gathering. We are delighted that you are a part of this event. Naturally, our regulars, our regular Silverside members and friends. But equally, we're delighted if you're joining us as a visitor. Those of us who know Silverside well are most likely missing our beautiful sanctuary tonight. Um, people first, sanctuary second. Our sanctuary is beautiful year round, but is especially beautiful when our flower committee and others have decorated it in the way that you see in this picture taken by Margaret Walker. This is a taste of how it is often decorated, and we miss it. Uh, we hope uh, after some repair work and uh, after some um, improvement in health situations that we will be back in the sanctuary in not too many weeks. I'm delighted that our liturgist this evening will be Liz Elmaker, and you'll start hearing her voice in just a few minutes and then several times throughout the gathering this evening. This reading is by Richard Paul Evans. The truest gift of Christmas is the gift of self.
is by Kathy Geiswhite, and I have a helper for this one. Sometimes the best Christmas present is remembering what you've already got. Isn't that right, Eleanor? days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea 
to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in the manger because there was no place for them in the inn. there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you, you will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom God favors.
The Jesus candle is now lighted. Gracious God, we are profoundly grateful that the baby Jesus grew up to become the adult Jesus who began to be the light of the world. And then through his teachings and through the way those teachings have been lived out by some in the long years since his death, he has continued to be the light of the world. We count ourselves extraordinarily blessed to be people who have been exposed more than just with a brush to those teachings, to have had an opportunity to study them and most importantly, to live them out in the world, thereby becoming a part of the greatest enterprise of all, being catalysts in an often darkened world of the light of Jesus. Amen. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This reading is by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Night, the beloved. Night, when words fade and things come alive. When the destructive analysis of day is done and all that is truly important becomes whole and sound again. 
when people reassemble their fragmentary selves and grow with the calm of a tree.
love the silent hour of night, for blissful dreams may then arise, revealing to my charmed sight what may not bless my waking eyes.
We are absolutely delighted that you've been a part of our gathering this evening. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to each of your dear ones from the Silverside community. And we hope that the new year that is upon us will be a very different year than we've experienced in 2020. We trust that it will, and we see all kinds of signs that it will be hopeful and happy signs. Let us all be a part of the energy that makes hope reality. The choir is about to start singing a two-part song. The first part of the song is Peace, Peace, and then it will become Silent Night. When the choir starts singing Silent Night, that's the time for you to light the candle that you've been sent as a gift by the pastor and the deacons. If you're a visitor or for some reason your candle did not reach you, Pause the video, find a candle in your house and bring it to uh, your computer here. Light the candle and leave it lit for the remainder of this gathering. Once again, the choir will begin singing Peace, Peace. They will transition into the singing of Silent Night. And when they begin to sing Silent Night, that will be your cue to light your candle. Also, we would like to have you join us in the morning at 10 for a special day Christmas wish from Melissa Hi and me.